This video explains how to remove background contamination from single-cell RNA sequencing data using CellBender. In this video, we will learn about background contamination and how to remove it with CellBender in Chipster. So far, we have used filter 10x feature barcode matrices generated by the CellRanger pipeline for downstream analyses. Now we will learn about this optional step that can be included in your analysis to create a new feature barcode matrix where background contamination has been removed. This new feature barcode matrix can be used as input to the setup and QC tool. We will first go through the problem of background contamination in single cell RNA sequencing data. Then we will compare the feature barcode matrices generated by CellRanger and CellBender. Then we will go through an example to show why CellBender could be useful before downstream analyses, and after that we will briefly go through the CellBender method. Finally, we will look at how to use CellBender in Chipster. So we have learned how to filter out low-quality cells, for example dead cells. However, estimated good-quality cells may still contain background contamination counts from cell-free ambient RNA or barcode swapping events. Therefore, the observed UMI counts are actually a sum of true biological counts and background contamination counts. One study found that background contamination is highly variable across replicates in cells, and 3-35% to of UMI counts per cell were from background contamination. This background contamination is a potential source of batch effects and spurious differential gene expression results. On the other hand, background contamination has a small effect on clustering. So far, we have learned to use these CellRanger filtered feature barcode matrices for downstream analyses. With CellBender, we use these raw feature barcode matrices as input. These raw matrices contain all barcodes that have at least one read, including empty droplets. CellBender estimates a new filtered feature barcode matrix of cells where counts from background have been removed. Because CellBender uses a different approach to estimate cells compared to CellRanger, the estimated cells in the new filtered feature barcode matrix might be slightly different. Now we will take a look at an example to get an idea of how the CellBender background removal method affects downstream analyses. So this is an example using single cell gene expression data from peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So far, we have not removed any background contamination counts from the data. We have identified some clusters and we know that the gene IGKC should be expressed by B cells. However, we see that all of the cell clusters express IgKC, so some of it could be contamination. In general, to get an idea of whether contamination is present in your data, is to identify cell clusters that are known not to express a specific gene. So if we knew that, for example, these clusters here should not express IgKC, we would estimate it to be contamination that we would possibly want to remove. CellBender estimates and removes systematic background contamination from all of the cells. The figure on the right shows clustering results after CellBender background removal. As mentioned earlier, clustering is a fairly robust method to background removal, which can also be seen in this example. CellBender only has a small effect on the global and local structures of clustering and we see cells grouping similarly in both figures. However, we now see that CellBender has removed gene expression of IgKC, especially in these clusters. This is, however, just an example, and for this dataset, it may not make sense to actually remove background contamination. Remember that CellBender might be useful when a high amount of contamination is present. So how does CellBender remove background contamination? 
Cellbender is a probabilistic model that takes into account key steps of the data generation process, including droplet formation and cell encapsulation. Cellbender models the observed UMI counts as a sum of true biological cell UMI counts and background contamination counts. For those interested in some of the mathematical details, I will now briefly go through the main points, but you can also skip these. The background contamination counts are drawn from a Poisson distribution, where the noise rate originates from two different contamination processes, which include cell-free ambient RNA and barcode swapping. These two different processes could lead to two different types of background profile because if the source of contamination is cell-free ambient RNA, each droplet should contain a small sample of this ambient RNA background profile. However, if the source of contamination is related to barcode swapping, swapping events occur at random and it would be expected that the background profile related to barcode swapping would be exactly the average of all of the RNA sequence in the experiment. The true UMI counts for each cell are modeled as a negative binomial distribution where the rate depends on several parameters including a prior on true gene expression rate. A neural network is used to learn a droplet-specific latent variable that determines this flexible prior. And here is an illustration of the full model. As you can see, Cellbender takes into account steps in the data generation process such as droplet size and capture efficiency. Here are the noise counts and here are the true cell UMI counts. Here is the neural network that determines the prior on true cell UMI counts. And here are the observed UMI counts. The estimated new feature barcode matrix is obtained by subtracting the likely noise counts from the observed counts. So now we will look at how to use Cellbender in Chipster. Cellbender can be used as a first step before the setup in QC tool. Use the raw feature barcode matrix in HDF5 file format as input to the Cellbender tool. Run Cellbender using default parameter values first. Then check the automated report and log files to see if changes are needed to these parameter values. These are the five different parameters available in Chipster. And I will now explain some key things to consider when making changes to these parameter values. The automated report file produces this UMI curve plot. It shows barcodes ranked by their UMI counts. You should use this plot and the log file to see if the automatically estimated values for the expected number of cells and total number of droplets included seem reasonable. The expected number of cells should include all droplets that reasonably surely contain cells. In this example, you can see from the log file that 2,383 are estimated to be Shirley cells. The total number of included droplets should include a number that goes a few thousand barcodes into the empty droplet plateau and include some droplets that are reasonably surely empty. In this example, this value is the sum of these values in the log file, so almost 12,000. So it is somewhere here and indeed goes a few thousand barcodes into the empty droplet plateau. Now we will move on to another type of plot in the report file. These are examples of learning curves. On the left is an example of a good learning curve where the elbow increases as training epochs increase after which it converges at a high plateau. And on the right is an example of a bad learning curve, where you can see large downward dips in the elbow. If you see these large dips, try reducing the learning rate by a factor of two. If you see that the learning curve does not converge at a high plateau, you can increase the number of epochs, but generally do not go beyond 300. Finally, we will take a look at the last parameter called nominal false positive rate. Any noise removal algorithm involves a trade-off 
between removing noise and retaining signal. The nominal false positive rate imposes an upper bound on the amount of falsely removed signal counts. The default value is fairly conservative and appropriate for most analyses, but you can modify this based on your dataset. A value of 1 represents removal of nearly every UMI count, meaning that almost all signal and noise are removed. Lastly, please remember to check for any warnings in the report or log files. For example, the report file issues warnings if it seems that you have not used the raw feature barcode matrix as input. To summarize what we have learned, clustering is a fairly robust method to cell bender background removal. However, especially when a high level of contamination is present, it can be a source of batch effects and spurious differential gene expression. Consider removing background contamination when a high level of contamination is present in your data. Use Cellbender as a first step in your analysis and use a raw 10x feature barcode matrix in HDF5 format as input to the Cellbender tool. Run Cellbender using defaults first and look at the report and log files to see if changes to the parameter values are needed. Use the new Cellbender filtered feature barcode matrix as input to the tool Setup and QC and continue with downstream analyses, including filtering, dimensionality reduction, and so on.